Chapter 1 The Ear, the Eye, and the Arm by Nancy Farmer, read by David Gould. Someone was standing by his bed, a person completely unlike anyone Tende had ever met. In the pre dawn light, his features were unclear. He was simply a presence of darker blue than the sky behind him. But there was about him a scent of woody smoke and new leaves and the honey of far off unseen flowers. The presence pointed at Tende and said, you. The boy woke up at once. The first rays of dawn were sliding over the garden wall and the window was empty. What a strange dream, thought Tende. He pulled the sheet over his head as he tried to remember it better. The image faded away, leaving a strange sense that something important was about to happen. His ancestors must have, must have felt this way before a big hunt. Tende imagined them lying on the warm, the warm earth of their huts, feeling it tremble with, te with destiny. Their shields and spears lay ready by the door. Not like me, he thought. He snuggled into a soft bed in one of the finest, finest mansions in Zimbabwe. Around the house were a large garden and a wall studded with searchlights and alarms. The automatic Doberman growled as it made a last tour of the lawn before retiring to its kennel. Any tremble of destiny would have to struggle through the concrete foundations of the house. It would have, ha it would, it would have to had to work through inlaid wooden floors and thick carpets to creep up the grand staircase to the second floor. Only a whisper could have found its way to his waiting ear. Yet find him it did. He heard the robot gardeners clipping the grass along a walk. Hupos called from the jacaranda trees, but a microchip went on with a far better selection of bird song. It was certainly beautiful, but Tende felt a pang of regret at not being able to hear the real birds. The Minya, a living creature smuggled in by the mellower, stirred in its cage. Manguanani, it said. Have you slept well? Kuda, Tende's little brother, sat up and answered, I have done it. I have done, so if you have done so. The Minya paid no attention to this polite reply. Manguani, Manguani, it shrieked, rattled the door of its cage. Kuda hopped out of the bed and released the bird. It fluttered to a table and snapped up a crust of bread from last night's supper. Tende could hear the crumbs showering over his books. He pulled the covers more tightly around his ears to keep in the light, happy feeling of excitement. A house robot purred to, as it went from door to door with the tea. It entered and placed two streaming cups on the table. The minya squawked as it was pushed aside. Good morning, said the robot. It's September 2nd, 2194. The time is 6.15 a.m. Breakfast is at 7. Be on time if you know what's good for you. Go away, muttered Kuda as he blew on the hot tea. Anyone who oversleeps is a big fat boo-boo head, re retorted the robot as it glided away. Rita programmed it to say that, Tende said as he threw back the covers. I know. Well, are you going to ask him? Could have swung his short legs off the edge of his chair. I'm not promising anything. You're a wimp. Tende didn't bother to argue. Kuda didn't know how difficult it was to ask father anything. That duty fell on the eldest brother. Besides, when Kuda got an idea in his head, it took an earthquake to dislodge it. I had the funniest dream this morning, Tende began. The mine nut just knocked over your tea, Kuda remarked. Tende grabbed a towel and cleaned up the mess. Then he quickly took a shower and dressed in a scout uniform. Breakfast was at seven, and not a minute earlier or later. The two brothers stood outside the dining room door, where they were joined by Rita. She was also in a scout uniform. A hundred years before, boy and girl scouts had to belong to different organizations, but now they were lumped together. Father approved of them because they taught the virtues most revered by the people of Zimbabwe. Loyalty, bravery, courteousness, and reverence. 
for Mawari, the Supreme God. Kuda had no scout uniform because he was only four. He did his best with a sand-colored shirt and pair of shorts. Breakfast! Chimed the door as it swung open. The children trooped in. They lined up in order with Tende, age 13, first, and Rita, 11, second. Tende was secretly embarrassed that he and Rita were the same height. Kuda was last. Mother smiled at them from her chair. She looked cool and elegant in her long white dress. She toyed with a slice of cantaloupe on a blue plate. All present and accounted for, said Father. Rita, stop slouching. The children stood as tall as they could manage as their father marched from his great chair at the head of the table. He wore a general's uniform with gold braid on his massive shoulders. His chest was covered with medals. Since it was breakfast and he was home and it was a warm day, he left his cap on a hat rack. Shirt tail out, Kuda. Five push-ups for you. Rita, pull in your stomach. You're not a watermelon, Tende. Father, stop. And Tende felt sweat prickle on his forehead. He loved his father, but sometimes he wished he wasn't so, so military. He suspected father would like to have mother at the end of the uh, at the end of the line, tall and perfectly groomed. But even father could hardly order her to do push-ups if he detected a loose thread. Tende passes inspection, said father and he stalked back to his chair. Tende relaxed, not letting it show. Passing inspection was as close as father ever got to praise. Perhaps he could um, ask the question after all. They were allowed to sit down, but things began to go wrong at once. The maid robot spooned porridge on the tablecloth. She had, uh, she had to be sent to the kitchen for readjustment. The butler took over the serving. He wouldn't give Rita extra sugar, and she sulked. The holophone trotted up to father's chair and clamored until he answered it. A report began to feed in. Pictures of fire engines and ambulances and ambulances flashed across its screen. Tende watched idly because he had nothing better to do. The masks, the only gang remaining after father's war and crime, had set off a bomb in a shopping center. Bodies were taken out of the smoking ruins. Statistics rattled across the bottom of the screen. Tende turned away. It was all remote, of no interest. A curse, masks, shouted Father at the holophone. Get me the chief of police. The, poli the phone bobbled and dialed. Father and the police chief made plans while the omelets on the everyone's plates got cold. Of course, no one thought of eating until Father was ready. He was an elder and head of the family. Lizard eggs, muttered Rita, poking at her omelet. Don't start, Tende said in a low voice. Chickens are descendant, descended uh, from reptiles. I read it in a book. Be quiet. Nasty, old, cold lizard eggs. Is something wrong? Thundered Father from the head of the table. No, said Tende, Rita, and Ken, and Kuda all together. Everything's delicious, added Rita, especially the eggs. Is it too much to ask when I'm trying to protect 10 million citizens from packs of hyenas that that want to tear down our civilization, is it too much to ask for a little peace and quiet at breakfast table? He slammed the receiver down. The holophone whimpered and cowered against a wall. Everyone ate in silence. Tende had a mental picture of his father lining up everyone in the, in the city. Ten push-ups for you. Twenty for you. He would growl as he inspected a, a line of ten million people. Tende had to clench his, his jaws to keep from laughing. What's this? said father as the as the butler robot placed a rack of dry toast by his plate. No butter until your blood pressure goes down. Doctor's order. Orders, the butler said. I hate dry toast, but father piled it with blackberry jam and ate it anyway. Tende listened to the bird song in the garden. He couldn't ask about the scout trip now. They were going to spend another long, boring day locked up in the house. All because father was afraid they would get kid they would get kidnapped. It's time for mellower, said mother in her gentle voice. Everyone looked up, even father, although he pretended he was he was only checking the time. The butler robot cleared away the dishes. They sat expectantly watching the door. He's late, said mother. 
He's always late, said father. Tinde felt a disloyal twinge of pleasure. The mellow, the mellower was the one person father couldn't organize. The mellower had smudges on his shoes, buttons dropped off his shirt, and were forgotten. His lunches lasted three hours, and he made paper airplanes of the homework he was supposed to supervise. Tinde, Rita, and Kuda often covered up for him. I'll send the butler after him, sighed mother. If he were one of my soldiers, I'd, I'd order him to do 50 push-ups, father said. No, a hundred. The sprinklers in the garden switched on. The odor of wet dust drifted through the window. It made Tende think of the storms that blew out of the Indian Ocean. He thought of the face of his ancestors turned toward the sky. They smiled as the rain opened the, the earth. They sang praises to Wari, whose voice is thunder, and to Hondoro, the spirit of the land. Wake up, whispered Rita, kicking him in, under the table. Tende straightened just as father looked at his, at his end of the table. It can't be 7.30, came the mellower's voice from down the hall. I'm sure I set the alarm. Oh dear, I'm such a bad boy. He hurried through the door and brushed a mop of blonde hair from his pale forehead. What a wonderful, patient people you are, he cried. I'm so lucky to be here. When I tell the other praise singers I work for the great General Amadeus Mat Matisica, Matisica, sorry, you guys, they're so jealous they could spit. And before Father could react, the mellower launched into his praise. Tende had heard praise singing described many ways. It was an ancient custom meant to call forth the power the powers of the seen and unseen worlds. It was music. It was poetry. But most of all, it was the medicine for the soul. Some mellowers were public and had offices. Many worked for hospitals, but a few were a, a, attached to great houses, like the Matiscas. Matiscas. They stood at the breakfast table and recounted the glories and the strengths of each family member. Today this place is full of noise and happiness. The guiding spirit of the general stands over us like a tree. Let all who are afraid take shelter under his mighty shadow. Tende noticed he was starting out with traditional poetry. The mellower compared father to a victorious bull in a green field, to the lion that represented father's totem. Then he changed to modern speech and described some of father's actual victories. He recounted how father rescued the president when Gondwanan terrorist attacked her house, how she made him chief of security for the land of Zimbabwe. He pictured the long, bitter struggle against the gangs. As the mellower talked, the lines on father's face relaxed. His eyes became distant and dreamy. Tende thought the change was amazing. As the cares and irritations dropped away, General Mat Matiska, Mat Mat Matsika, sorry you guys, became the father Tende wished he really had. Then the mellower spoke of mother's chemistry discoveries and her position as, as a professor at the university. Mother's eyes shone with pleasure. He praised Rita for winning a national science prize. He expressed happiness over her plumpness which showed promise of great beauty. The, peev the peevishness in Rita's face melted away. Kuda said the praise singer spoke as clearly as a child twice his age, nor did he have childish fears. Kuda was brave, a little elephant whose tusks were itching for battle, like the great general himself. Kuda scowled it fierce fearsomely, as though enemies were present right in the room. Now a struggle began as the mellower turned to Tende. The man always saved him for the last, because Tende suspected he sensed the resistance. Tende didn't like the power praise had over him. Of course, he trusted Mellower. No one else paid him as much attention. If, if the truth were known, he liked the man as much of, as his own father. But sometimes, often actually, he had trouble remembering exactly what the Mellower had said. Afterward, there was a period when he felt sleepy and a little foolish, and he fought to keep from being entranced. entranced. Most of the time, he won. Tende listened 
coldly to, to a description of his swimming prizes and the, and the badges he won in the scouts. He wavered a little when Mellower talked about how he rescued Rita from a boating accident. Then the man re reverted to the traditional style of praise singing. He goes forth to explore as his ancestors once followed rivers to a new land as they stood on hills, their spirits bold, bold as lightning. Tende was lost, or perhaps lingering effect of the dream he had that morning. He was surrounded by the scent of wood smoke mixed with the distant honey, honeyed flowers. He, he was followed a trail. He was following a trail. The pug marks of a line preceded him, like flowers printed in the dust. It waited for him on a rise not far away and shook its glorious mane. Follow me, it whispered. Tende woke up. He couldn't tell how long he'd been hypnotized. Everyone sat around the table with contented smiles. Microchip birds sang sweetly from the gardens. Mmm, sighed Mother, stretching her arms before her. Rita yawned and prodded Kuda. No push-ups for you, rumbled Father. The mellower bowed politely and withdrew. Very slowly, the room came back to life. To Tende, it was like walking underwater. Father lounged in his great chair and with his large feet stuck out before him. He nodded, he nodded benevolently at the family. Now was the time to ask about the trip, but the same torpor that had overtaken Father had affected Tende. He knew he ought to speak, but it was so comfortable to go back to the beauty to the beautiful vision he had seen during praise. The holophone rang. Library, ordered Father, rising from his chair. The holophone skittered in front of him as he strode down a passage. The library door closed, and ten days opportunity was lost. Where does the time go? cried Mother as the ancestor clock in the hall announced that it was 8.30. She gathered up her lecture notes and somewhat, and somewhat distractedly, distractedly called the children together. Do your lessons well. Remember the martial arts instructor is coming at nine. Tell the mellower I've programmed the pantry to provide a nutritious nutritious lunch. And this time, he is to see you actually eat it. She looked sharply at Rita. Kuda, you must not tease the automatic Doberman. Its chain is almost worn through. Bad boy. Kende, I expect you to be responsible for the others. Then, because the stretch limo was already humming on the anti-gravity pad, she patted them fondly and ran out the door. Tende, Rita, and Kuda waved as the limo flew off toward the university. Oh, boar, said Rita. The martial arts instructor's already here. Hey, you guys, if you've enjoyed chapter one of The Ear, the Eye, and the Farm by Nancy Farmer, please give me a like so people can see this video on their feed. Please subscribe if you're not a subscriber. And yes, I do mumble over my words, and sometimes I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit of a poor reader, but I do my best. So I will continue on with chapter two very soon. I will also be doing a few other things as well. I will be reading a, a preface um, to, uh, this, to this story. Um, there will be a glossary of words um that you guys can reference there will be an appendix and also reading questions if you guys are um you know maybe you're facilitators or you are you know a teacher and you're doing this for your class so this very first um chapter i will have uh, subtitles um but most of the chapters i do not do subtitles as it's expensive to do but i appreciate the people that who do it so thanks again for, for uh, listening to this Nancy Farmer story. I'm looking forward to, to, uh, to reading this. Thank you so much.